started. Let's get started. Thanks. Thanks to all of you for being here today. My name is Rich Lyons. I'm the Dean of the Business School here, the Haas School of Business. And this is the Dean Speaker Series. So this is our highest profile speaker series. Many of you have been here before, right? You've, you've seen Jeff Immelt. Uh, we had uh, Hank Paulson here, Arun Sarin, uh, Vinod Kozla, lots and lots of speakers recently, and a wonderful, wonderful speaker that we have here today. Let me also mention our, our next couple of talks coming up. Uh, Stephen Pratt, CEO of Infosys, will be speaking here. Uh, that's uh, in connection with our career services uh, uh, career Management Conference, that's on October 20. That one's also a midday, 12.30 session. And then in November, our, our former dean and friend Tom Campbell will be here. Govern, uh, governor race, he's obviously a governor. Goober. <laughs> Let me start over. He is uh, running for governor, and he is... Uh, <laughs> He is hot in hot pursuit, and we'll get to hear what, what he's been up to. He's going to be speaking on political leadership in a world of suspicion. Uh, capacity crowd today. Thanks for you be being here, and also a lot of excitement about the, the talk today, given how linked it is to the things that this business school does. I'm honored, we are honored to have Mr. Hurd here today. Uh, he really doesn't do this very often, uh, no kidding, and I appreciate it personally that he made time to, to do this here at, at Berkeley Haas. Uh, we will open it up for q and A. I think his presentation will be on the shorter side, so that we'll make sure to get plenty of interaction going. Uh, he is the leader of the world's largest technology company, as most of you know. Well, let me say a few words about HP, and there's so many more that I could say. Uh, over a billion customers, over 170 countries, uh, six continents, obviously, over 300,000 employees, about 320, number nine on the Fortune 500 rank. These are numbers, right? Uh, Mr. Hurd joined HP about four years ago. He joined as CEO and president. The next year, he became chairman of the board. Under his leadership, with the goal of establishing HP as the world's leading information technology company, it has grown revenue from $80 billion in 2004 to $118 billion in 2008, and more than doubled its earnings per share, obviously important. Prior to HP, as all of you know, 25 years at NCR, where he was, uh, just before the transition, CEO and president of NCR. Uh, bachelor's degree, business administration from Baylor University. Quoted earlier this year in Fortune magazine, great companies excel in tough times, and in tough times, customers turn to great companies. At the same, in that same issue, Fortune magazine named HP as one of the world's most admired companies in 2009. With great pleasure, Mark, thank you for being here. Thank you. You know, uh, thanks, Rich. It's great to be here. Um, I don't do this often, so... Um We'll try to make it good. Um, I was trying to think of California stories, uh, University of California stories, and I could only think of two. I told Rich when I came here, um, my memories of Cal are not good. Um, as Rich described, I went to Baylor University, uh, and I can't remember what year this was. It must be like 98, 99. We had a football team at Baylor that was, I don't know, 1 in 10, 2 in 9, something like that. And the coach had told me the next year was our year. We're turning it. First game of the year, University of California at Berkeley. The first year of Jeff Tedford, so that would tell you what year it was. So I was in Dayton at the time at NCR, and I flew here for the game. This game uh, started out first play. Cal ran the ball back to the 20. First play through a backward pass, and then threw it over our corner's head 14.51 to go, first quarter, Cal 7, Baylor nothing. Uh, we then got the kickoff, ran it back to the 20, first play. Baylor quarterback drops back, throws a pass, picked off by University of California cornerback and ran it back for a touchdown. 14.39 to go, first quarter, Cal 14, Baylor nothing. This thing turned into a 70-14 to 14 route to which the president of Baylor uh, looked at me and said, this is the singular worst sporting event I have ever attended. <laughs> so that's the last time I was on the Cal campus. And the, the only other uh, sort of short-term uh, intersection I've had with Cal was our CFO, our chief financial officer, is a lady named Kathy Leschak. Kathy went to Stanford but then came to Haas to get her, her grad degree. She loves Haas. Um, 
and she did a speaking engagement for the, for the branch like I can't remember when, and it was around Labor Day weekend, and I was doing the same thing for Baylor, and I was doing it at their first football game, which was in Fort Worth, and uh, they happened to choose to do it at a restaurant in Fort Worth, and the corporate communications people at, uh, at, at HP were working on it, and they said, what are you working on? They said, we're doing a speech for Kathy, because she's talking to the Haas School of Business, and I can't remember, it was like at the Transamerica Tower or someplace in San Francisco, and Mark's going to a uh, Mexican restaurant in Fort Worth to talk to a bunch of Baylor business guys. So, so those are my intersections with Haas. So with that, I'll do my best to, to, to tell you a little bit about HP. And I do, to Rich's point, want to take questions you've got. I'll, I'll do everything I can to answer anything I can. Uh, I think Rich told you a little bit about HP. We're obviously about $118 billion in revenue. That was 2008. Uh, my prediction will be in 2009. We'll probably work all year to be roughly the size we were in 2008. It's been a very difficult economy. This is a year that we won't grow, uh, affected a lot by currency, you know, the euro. Uh, just to get an idea, 70% of Hewlett Packard's revenue is outside the United States. About 70% of our employees are outside the United States. So we're extremely, extremely global company. Only 29% of our revenue is in the US, and that is the smallest of really all uh, the major technology companies. Our supply chain is the largest in the IT industry by a long ways. We ship three PCs basically every second. We ship about three printers every second. So, and then we have to sell those. So, um, we, we, we're, I'm burning time here. Um, we, ship, we ship a server, a server about every 10 seconds. So when you think of the sheer scale of the logistics environment, and, and it's got to move globally, and we have to get things to the right place, to the right person, at the right time. So the scale of logistics environment is, is huge, and then we have 180,000 people that service something, either for an enterprise customer or for uh, a consumer. So imagine we get 500 million times a year, a consumer calls us and says, help me. So the sheer scale of the, of the environment is large. We are number one. Our businesses compete in 19 solution segments or product segments. We're number one in basically 15 of those. We're number one in the world, you'd imagine, in PCs, in printers. We bought EDS. We're now the second largest services company uh, on the planet. And one of the things, we, Rich and I talked a little earlier about culture. It's very important at HP that everything we do we are the best, absolutely the best at everything we touch. Um, we are the only tech company with an integrated ecosystem. And let me try to tell you what that means. Uh, we've built the company on a couple of fundamentals. I've talked to you about the supply chain. There is on top of that supply chain a PC market, a server market, a storage market, and a networking market. I'm not the best drawer. But think of those segments as networking's 45 billion, story, that's the size of the market, storage is 50 billion, servers are 60 billion, the PC market is 150 billion. Those three ecosystems are $300 billion worth of business. And changing very dramatically as we speak. All leveraging, all with different leader, different players in them, different segments, different economics, and all converging simultaneously. We've built on top of that the sixth largest software company in the world, and then we've built a services business on top of that. That's the second biggest services company in the world, and I don't know who number one is. Now, that said, We've done this, we've built this portfolio that we have by spending basically $37 billion in the last four years. 17 billion of R&D and 20 billion on acquisitions to build, to Rich's point, the biggest technology company in the world with an integrated strategy to support consumers and to support enterprises across the planet. Let me give you some demographics about the IT industry. 
Anybody know, you guys are big, I, I heard nothing but great things about this business school. Anybody know Pop Quiz? Worldwide gross domestic product? Mmm. Come on. Worldwide GDP. A little more, but you're very good. It's very good. 52 trillion. Depends on what this year comes in. Last year, about 52 and a half, almost 53 trillion. So 53 trillion is worldwide GDP. Anybody know the size of the IT industry inside GDP? Want to take a crack? 1.9 trillion. So 1.9 trillion is all of the industry. HP's products and services can compete for most of it. About 1.4 trillion. So if everybody would do what I said, <laughs> our revenue would go from 118 billion to 1.4 trillion. That's sort of what that, what that, what that says. I was telling Rich, we were talking about decision rights earlier. If I had decision rights over all the purchases, yes. So um, that gives you sort of an idea of the size of the industries. Now, um, and imagine that we compete across that, across consumer, enterprise, across geographies, to get to all of that spending. So it's a huge, huge market. Now, remember this. At the same time as this industry is developing as it is, think of the amount of, world, amount of data on the planet today. Do you think there's a lot of data on the planet? Pop quiz, yes, no. <laughs> yes. OK, imagine whatever it is, in four years, it will double. Four years from now, there will be twice the amount of data that there is today. Anybody know what percentage of today's data is digital? I see people here with laptops, people here with cell phones. You're able to access today 3% of the world's data digitally. It's doubling every 18 months. The world you're walking into is going to be very different than the one I walked into. So now the data is doubling, and the access to data is doubling at two and a half times the speed that the data is doubling. This is going to cause a mountain of data and not necessarily a mountain of information. A lot of data to work through. Simultaneously, a physical, I, gra I grabbed some stats here, so I thought I'd, I'd, sure I'd share these with you. I do these in various speeches, but I thought I'd bring them together just to give you some data. Worldwide population between now and 2025, 6.2 billion to 7.8. 1.6 billion more people. Varies by country. India, number of people between 20 and 50 will grow by more than 60%. 60%. In Germany, the people under 40 will decrease by about 28%. Upside down pyramid. So vastly changing demographics. Growing younger populations completely change the thirst for infrastructure, the need for infrastructure to be a conduit for data and information. All of these countries, by the way, ur does everybody understand the urbanization that's occurring? Worldwide urbanization is going to grow by a billion people over the next 20 years. A billion people. So let me try to put that in context for you. There'll be a Beijing built every other month. You think there's infrastructure to support all that? I'll give you the answer. No. No. So the job that we have is to be the ones to support that data, support that digitization, and support this massive demographic change that's going to occur over the course of the next 20 years. Much of it actually not being in the US, but being in emerging markets, where none of the capability that many of us take for granted today uh, enjoy. Global middle class will grow by 40% to 1.3 billion people from 440 million today. So a 3x growth in the worldwide middle class. About 20% of the world's people are online. About 4 billion have wireless devices of some type or another. Go to Eastern Europe, only 25% of the people have a landline. The way they connect with the web is through a notebook with a wireless card because there is no infrastructure. 
So we have to educate, build, and arm techno people with this technological capability over the course of the next 20 years. So for us, listen, uh, we've got the opportunity to deploy. We spend about $4 billion a year in innovation. And our job is to innovate against and into that opportunity. We'll continue to build out our capabilities so that this data set, all of this content I talked about, doubling of the data, doubling of the digitization every 18 months, this portfolio's job is to process all that data and content, to store it, to move it, to share it, to visualize it. We like it too when it's printed. And then we have to service at the enterprise and consumer level all of that capability. That infrastructure I just told you about is HP. We spend our R&D to build a portfolio to enable that demographic change, that digitization change, the secular trends we just described, to occur. So I think, you know, listen, that's, that's the mission we're on. We've built out probably now a portfolio. I hate to be too, uh, let me not say what I was going to say. Tell it to you differently. We think strategically of the world through four lenses, or we look at it through four lenses. How we run HP operationally. If you're a customer of HP, you can probably tell me things you wish HP did better. And we know, we think, we know what many of those are. And trust me, it's a long list. Simultaneously, we look at the world through the portfolio of products and solution we bring to customers. What are we bringing to customers that help them make their day-to-day -day life better, whether you're a big company or whether you're a consumer? Thirdly, we try to understand what our competition is doing, and at the same time, we try to understand the secular trends going on around the planet, meaning that we wouldn't invest into, necessarily invest our portfolio that was counter to a secular trend. We would try to support and drive a secular trend, globalization, mobility, digitization. So for example, us investing into a solution that was, I don't want to get too technical here, but analog, probably not the greatest idea when the world's moving more digital. So we look at the world through four simultaneous, and think of these lenses as cyclical driving each other, both clockwise and counterclockwise, kicking out of it a portfolio and a strategy to be able to automate the planet. That's what we've worked on. Operationally for us, for those of you that plan to go into business, uh, Rich talked a little bit about our statistics has caused us to do a lot of stuff. We had 79 billion in revenue in 2004. As uh, Rich described, we made three and a half billion. Which meant, does anybody know this math? 79 billion minus three and a half. Can anybody do that math? What is 79 minus three and a half? 75 and a half. Boy, you guys are good. That's how much money we spent. That means we spend 13 million an hour. So then the question is when you go spend 75.5 billion, why do you spend that 75.5 billion? How is that going to help affect this answer? And that's caused us to spend four years realigning every dime. We've zero based every dollar we spend from zero up. Don't tell me what you spent last year and I need 5% more. Tell me why you spent the first dollar. And that's caused us to drive a environment of zero based budgeting everything, realigning our cost, realigning our expense, to trying to improve the outcome and trying to measure that. It's caused us culturally to move a lot towards performance management, performance leadership, at the same time as we drive clarity of strategy, clarity of operational performance, and drive to achieve that. Rich and I talked a lot about culture earlier. You know, for us, our culture has gone from 
one of starting many of the business practices you think of today were started by Hewlett or Packard. Management by objectives is one. Management by walking around. Many of the things that are thought of today as norms in business started by Hewlett or Packard, particularly those that are inherent here in the valley or over in the valley. For us, we've had to supplement that with basically working on three things. And this is one thing I'll make sure I want to make sure I leave to you today. I believe CEOs work on three things. It's a hundred things for them to go work on. Trust me. Three big ones to get right. Make sure you've got a strategy. Second, make sure you've got an operating model that executes the strategy. Third, get the best people in the world to execute the operating model. When you go to a get a chance to go to a cocktail party or speak at the Haas School of Business, those are all nice to do's. But if you don't get the three fundamentals right, you'll never get the job done. Those are the three cornerstones of getting the business right. So listen, I could talk a lot more, talk a lot about culture, talk about a lot the direction of the, the company, the IT industry, but I'd rather talk about what, whatever you'd like to talk about, take any question you got, and that's what I'll try to do. From you is when you ask your questions, we want you at the microphone because we're capturing this, okay? So please, uh, those of you that would like to ask a question, there's a microphone down here, there's one up there as well. Please, sir, go ahead. Monetization um, of information. Um, I'd like to hear how HP is thinking through the smart grid. Uh, a lot of the other major IT players have signaled great interest, and I was just wondering how you're thinking about it. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things you've got to be careful about with the IT industry, right? We uh, tend to message a lot of esoteric things that um, it's sort of like one of the later things you've heard is, have you heard of this cloud computing? It's another popular thing. I, I was fortunate enough or unfortunate enough to, to go to the business round table, which is the 100 CEOs of the 100 largest companies in the country, do a presentation on cloud computing as an example. And um, CEOs came back with a great thing. Why do you tech guys always want to be in the clouds? <laughs> Can't you operate in clear skies? And some of these things are, are, are quite confusing. Smart grid, um, if you think about it, there are some very, um, how would I say it, Rel real projects coming out of smart grid today. You know, there's one going on in San Jose, there's one going on in Chicago, there's one about to go in Miami, which basically is the automation or the attempted automation of, of basically power and energy in a, in a, in a city, for example. Let's, let's, let's stick with that. And yeah, I mean, about 35% of the componentry in a smart grid is what core IT, servers, storage, networking, software that would manage that infrastructure. About 35% of it is specialty products that are unique to sort of the power industry, smart meters, et cetera, et cetera, so that we can automate things. Uh, and then the rest is sort of an eclectic group of products that, that's sort of around the fringe of it. But the real promise of this is to automate standard processes that you know, we don't have today. So you know, imagine at a home today, uh, something as simple as being able to automate the home from a power perspective. It'd be nice to have a cockpit you know, at home where you say, my refrigerator is using this much energy, my TV is using this much energy, et cetera, et cetera, and being able to, in an automated way, be able to deal with that and understand exactly what you're consuming and do that home by home, neighborhood by neighborhood, company by company, and being able to look at the ag aggregate. It's no different than when I put this software map up here. Companies today are doing the very same thing. They're able to look at their entire, for example, I can tell you that Hewlett Packard uses, has a $700 million utility bill a year. How do I know that? Because we actually have a cockpit of everything that consumes power. And we know how to turn it up or turn it down. We know how to deal with peak. We know how to deal with threshold. Much of the power in the country, for example, 35 estimates, 35 to 40 percent of the power in the country is, um, how would you say it, power used without a purpose. I left this on. I left that on. I didn't really understand that this was consuming power. For example, historically, our printers, when they were plugged in, used power even when they were idle. They keep going back to the socket looking for power. Great innovation idea. Don't do that. We've been able to do that. Same thing with a PC. You know, for example, every time you retire 10 PCs, it's like taking a car off the road. You take 10 PCs and put in 10 new PCs. 
so there's many of these things go into this whole concept of energy and how we deal with the environment. I mean, HP just got named the number one green company on the planet by Newsweek. And, and you know, for us, it's all about making products that feed into things like smart grid that allow those things to become a reality. So we're very active in it, both as a prime contractor, but also a partner with people like, I heard Jeff Emmel was here, GE would be a big partner of ours in the smart grid arena. Please do use the microphone. Thanks. So um, you mentioned a, a little bit about how with the costs that you're looking at, you look at from the bottom down, where is it coming from? How do you balance that with kind of wanting to do a lot of innovation? You mentioned, I think, $4 billion, where a lot of times costs are less predictable. How are you able to balance that? And how, I guess, how do you drive cost and innovation? Yeah, I mean, you're saying, I think, I think, if I understand, the balance between a cost-centric model at the same time as you're trying to innovate. Listen, at the core of any technology company, and I'm obviously very, uh, uh, I'm an IT guy, and that's, that's where I've spent my career, you got to get three things right. you got to innovate, you got to sell stuff, and you got to service it. I mean, those are the three core things. If you're not doing those three things, you got to ask why. So when you want to spend a dollar, I have a simple question, just why? What, what's the return for the customer? What's the benefit for the customer? What's the benefit that the market's going to see because we spent this? So it's like when somebody tells me uh, I'm spending, we spent $4 billion a year in R&D. And somebody says, you know, it's R&D. It's good. And, and you, know, you sure? Sure, because I want to segment. You know, I'll give you an example of what happens in big companies. Because I'm sure all of you, does anybody here have an ambition to go and work in a big company? No? Everybody, nobody? <laughs> Come on. Anybody here want to work in a big company? Come on. Anybody want to be CEO of a big company? Uh -huh. so, so listen, let me give you an idea. This, is, this will be the fun you can have. I'll give you a little simulation game. You show up at HP on March of 2005. They say we spend $75.5 billion. We spend $4.2 billion of the 75.5 on our own internal information technology. So, wow, it's a lot of money. Oh, yeah, yeah, but it's good. It's good. And, and, uh, and you should feel good about that. You should feel good about that because we benchmarked IBM, and they spend the same percent of revenue, about a little more than 5% of revenue the same we do. So, wow. So it's an interesting metric. It's funny, though, because they have 38 points of gross margin, and we have 23. You still feel good about it? They have 100,000 more people than we do. You still feel good about it? Well, those are different metrics. I said, right, we're going to use mine <laughs> and not yours. And, and so when you go into an environment like, like that, for example, dots that people don't want to connect, and I encourage you to think holistically about the enterprise. Those 19,000 people we had in IT, at that time, we had 16,000 salespeople. So you'd ask a question, do you think it feels good when companies' cores are R&D, creating demand and servicing it, that our IT department could beat up our sales force from just a sheer physical power uh, perspective? Does that feel right to you? Well, I never thought about that. Okay, well, I'd like you to think about it that way because we've got to get our human capital in the right, in the right spot. So I think it's important, again, for a CEO to sit down and make sure we're optimizing the deployment to the enterprise. So when you get into R&D, for example, just telling me it's an R&D, I expect you to tell me how many people are really working on the new wireless printer that we just released. How many people are working on the newest Blade server in the world? Who's working on Skyroom video conferencing on a PC? These are new, innovative products. But if that's 10% of my R&D, where's the other 90? I want you to tell me what's going on. So I think inspecting, and what I try and do is inspect at a relatively le low level of detail to get clarity, not just for me, but clarity in our management team explaining the choices they've made, either consciously or unconsciously, to align our spending to, out to affect the outcome. So I don't really look at it as just cost cutting, because if it was easy to cut cost, everybody would do it. I think the general feeling of cost cutting is to say, you know, if it was easy to cut costs, you just call up everybody not doing anything important, um, show up in the parking lot, and then we'll let you go. And of course, nobody shows up. So, so if you start with, okay, let's examine the work, and the way to get cost out, sustained cost out, is to eliminate the work, change the work, make it go away, 
Don't do things that you don't need to do. So that's the way we look at it. And then the objective really is to spur the money into innovation. Not to cut the innovation, but as a percent of what you spend, spend more on innovation, more on creating demand, and more on service. So that's the way we think about it. In this time of where we've realigned our costs, our sales force has gone from 16,000 to today just under 29. Our number of engineers in the company have gone from 36,000 to 43,000. Yet we spend less money in total as a company because we've realigned that spend and everything's up for debate. I don't know if that helps, but that's, that's okay. Thank you. Um, would you give us an example of what HP is doing to address the issue of e-waste and how you all are re reducing the amount of heavy metals used in your products? We're trying. Um, you know, it's a big deal for us. I mean, we are heavy, very heavy in the recycling world. We took our first 20 years focused on recycling. We recycled about a billion pounds of, of, of IT. Um, we took three years to get our second billion. So it's a big deal for us to be able to, to recycle this capability. It has to go way back into the front end of the supply chain to be using the cape, the, sort of speak, the componentry and the parts that can be recycled because there's parts and components that are much more, I can where's this word right, recyclable. I think that would be the way I would say it. And so that's what we choose to do. So we put a big commitment on it. We are the number one recycler of IT on the planet. So our, when we lease things to our leasing company, our leasing company actually, we've got a process now where we can take something back, recycle it, and actually put that capability right back into new products. So you know, the more we do it, now to be very blunt, if you went back even five, six, seven years ago, the componentry wasn't nearly as recycle friendly as it is with new products today. So we have a strong commitment to it um, in every dimension. The good thing about what's going on now with e-waste and even the whole green economy is it's not just good for, it's just not a noble cause, it's good business. So, you know, today, I mean, I'll give you one little innovation, something very small. Our guys in labs, I had the Secretary of State at the time, Condoleezza Rice with me, and I'd, I'd gone into a data center um, in, uh, in, in HP Labs, and they told me this was a revolutionary thing, and I walked in at data centers. How many people have ever been in a data center? One thing you notice, it's cold. It's cold. I walk in one, and it's, it's warm. It's like 71 degrees. And I walk into the data center, and I go, wow. And she, Condoleezza Rice looks at me and goes, yeah, there's a lot of stuff in here. And I mean, no, 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 no. It's, 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 it's very warm. And the reason it's warm, and by the way, that's what takes out cost, being able to get the temperature up. And the reason it's warm is because our labs guys figured out how to run cold air through a little wire. And the cold air only blows on the heat. Instead of, heat, instead of cooling the entire room, I've now cooled only where the heat is. And I can take the temperature from 61 or 62 to 71. That power, by the way, when we redid all of our IT, we took enough power out of our internal IT to power Palo Alto and Menlo Park for a full year. Just out of our internal IT. Imagine what we could do to the world's IT. Now, just to make sure you're clear, IT as an industry, that 1.9 trillion, consumes about a little less than 2% of the world's power. So we, we can do a lot, but we're, it's gonna have to be a team sport if you really wanna get, get more efficient. So IT is not, is not the only driver here of what's consuming the world's energy. Hope that helps, hope that helps. Yes. Yeah, I had a question, um, how did you exactly get to the position you're at? Like, would you contribute it more to like networking with people or like being in the right place at the right time or just it was all that. work? I was, like I was on a corner um, over at Page Mill uh, and I was there and they said, we're looking for a CEO. And I said, listen, I'm, I'm, I'll try, I'll try. You, you know, uh, it's a, uh, it's an interesting question. I mean, I, 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 I tell you, I did not go out trying to be one, so that wasn't, you know, how I, how I, how I think about it. Um, I was part of a company that um, really rotated people, and I got the opportunity to do a lot of jobs, working for a lot of great people, and they all were good enough to share with me. 
And not all of them were individually great. They all had good things, though, that, that were just tremendous help to me. And then, uh, Rich and I talked about this earlier. I mean, I do think a lot of people start out saying, uh, I'm going to be a CEO. And that's my, you know, that's my thing. And my encouragement would be to you would be slow down and make sure you know what you're getting into, point one. Uh, point two, if you really do want to do it after you've thought about it and you're willing to make all the sacrifices, because I'll tell you one thing, the pay's good. The sacrifices are numerous. And when you get there, um, you can't call time out. There is no on-the-job training. There is no business school that's going to come help you. There is no lifeline. You've got to perform or you're done. And you can be done quick. CEOs are like products or brands. They come out quickly with one, and they're typically good or bad, and it's hard to shake them. So my advocation to you would be take your time. Try to get into an environment where you can work with great people and try to rotate through just as many assignments as you possibly can so that when you get the job, you've got as much domain knowledge as possible. Because I can't tell you how many people want to tell you stories. You ever heard the stories of policemen when they tell you when they pull over cars, how many stories they get? It's just like a CEO. How come this worked out the way? Oh, let me tell you all the things that happened. Really? You want to tell me that story? Because let me tell you what happened when I had your job. And the more of those type of experiences you can have globally across different business models, you just, when you get in the chair, you want to be as prepared as you can be. And I think the reason I got the job at the time was um, I'd done a lot of things. I'd been in a company similar to HP that was very global. It was in 170 countries. We had five separate distinct business models. Now, HP was 79 billion, and CR at that time was a little over seven, so it was 10 times the size. And I would get the question of, do you think complexity is gonna be tougher at HP? And complexity is not driven by scale, because if you showed me a one monoline company, only sold one product and it was all in the US, that $80 billion one product US company is probably sim simpler than a $7 billion global multi-line company. And so there was a lot of similarities and, and uh, I'm sure there's other things, but I wasn't the one that selected me. So at the end of the day, I think it is just go through the jobs and get as prepared as you can be. And, and I, I guess the last piece, just make sure you're willing to go do it because when you do it, nobody cares. By the way, just another piece of my winogram when you wake up, nobody cares if you're tired. Nobody cares it's been a rough day. Nobody cares what your last phone call was like. You're the one expected to be on the ball, to be the center of attention, to be the steady hand, to be the one deploying confidence, the one to make sure the strategy, the operating, and the operating model, and the people are properly lined up every minute of the day. So it's fun. <laughs> it's fun. Hi, Mark. Thanks for coming here. Sure, my First pleasure. question is, um, you mentioned about the IT market, which is about $1.8 to $1.9 trillion. Yes. At what rate is it growing for the next five or 10 years or 20 years? You know, there's a lot of debate on it. Uh, you know, I'd say, generally speaking, the IT market has been viewed a 3 to 4% growing market. It typically grows a little faster than global GDP. So if you believe the statistics that I told you earlier about the urbanization of the market, the globalization of the market, the digitization of the market, it's probably reason to believe it's going to grow a couple, fast, a couple points faster than worldwide GDP. I think the more important part of it is that market is changing dramatically underneath the spend. So it isn't just about the $1.9 trillion. It's the fact that in these segments I described to you, how you think about a server, how you think about a storage device, how you think about a networking device, how you think about software and services is changing simultaneously with the growth. So the shift in the balance of power, the reason HP has been scaling is because it's been playing into these secular trends that are occurring. So I would predict about a three or 4% IT growth, but inside it, fairly big shifts of market share within it. Like we've gained this year, even in a bad economy, lots of market share. 
And I think it's because our portfolio is moving into where the market's headed as opposed to the other way. Thank you. Thank may, you. I have, may I ask one more question? Sure. You, you mentioned that a CEO normally has different dimensions to look at and they pick up the top few strategies that they think are going one to One more work. time. I didn't quite hear what you said. I said you mentioned that as, as a CEO, you get to work in different dimensions and each CEO picks up the top two or three uh, areas that they want to work at. Yes. We know uh, HP, prior to your coming to HP, was in a different state in, of acquisition, and now we see HP in a different state. The Wall Street technology is where HP stands today. Yes. How was, maybe you can tell us the one or two or three strategies that you had different from where HP was going before. You know, I, I um, would tell you that uh, I get that question a fair amount about the before and after view. I, I think the stories about how screwed up HP were, was before I got there are greatly exaggerated. Uh, I think HP was a great company. I think it's always been a great company. It's a company with great people, with great history, with great culture. I think we just hadn't maybe operationalized all the things we needed to. I don't think it was a company that was nearly um, the press. You know, listen, the press, in my opinion, I love, is there a lot of press here? I love the press. <laughs> I love the press. But I, I, I do think you tend to exaggerate success at the same time as you exaggerate the opposite. And it's like, you know, I, I, was, I did a thing with uh, Business Week the other day where they were saying, listen, you know, it's so much, you know, you've had so much, you, me, have had so much success. It's just nonsense, right? I mean, our company requires a team effort. To build a great big company, it's a team sport. It requires lots of great people. And I've got to tell you, the, one of the benefits I've had at HP is I've either inherited a great team and also recruited a great team. I have a great team of people that help me. They allow me to come here and talk today with confidence that our business is being executed. And that ain't me. My job is to create sort of the game plan and make sure those three points are done. You need great people to do it. One thing I would tell you just as a piece of advice is there are some people who get threatened by having great people around them. I'd rather not, I want to be indispensable. There's that thought. And if I put people that are great around me, it's a threat. I'm sure none of you would admit or have that discussion in public. There are people that believe that. My advice to you is don't believe that. Get the best people, motivate, and get the best people to work with for you. And when you get good ones, keep them, retain them, challenge them, motivate them. They are your success. People are the difference. And so I think for us, it's just been trying to operationalize. I think our strategy was still good and maybe a little crisper now, but it, we didn't go from strategic plan A to strategic plan B. Uh, I, I felt good about the majority of our shit. We had to simplify our operating model. One thing we had was a very thick matrix and a very deep hierarchy. We had 12 levels between the CEO and the individual contributor. We're now eight. It used to take 2.2 people on average to make a decision at HP. It's now 1.4. And, and one, one thing you would notice that I would tell you one thing we did measure in the company was when you go look at levels of management and draw this for any company, ask any big company how many levels it is. And then also ask them how many people need to touch a decision every time they make a decision. And then just simply connect those dots. And however wide the circle is, your job is to make sure it's as tight as possible. We've cut out four layers of management. We've taken about 40% out of the decisioning, and that circle is smaller. What's ever in this circle is waste. Cycle time, cost, employee <coughs> frustration, customer bureaucr bureaucracy the customer sees. Uh, so cutting as much of that out is a huge deal. We did cut a lot of that out. But don't, I, I would not want to leave you with the thought that HP was some massively screwed up company, is now some great company, and this has all happened. It's amazing. It's miracle work. It's just not like that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So you mentioned that some of the statistics about digital data and information, and I was wondering if you could comment on some of the trends as they affect the printer and ink and cartridge business and how you see those markets developing and sort of what trends are gonna, gonna drive yeah. HP's uh, classic printer business. What's the printer? Yeah, I'll try to be quick like? because printing's sure. a, a broad subject, but there's pe more pages are being printed, not less. So we have about 55, 60% of the home printer market, that's what you think of us as, but we have about 1.6% of all the pages that are printed. 
So think of us going into markets where the pages are printed. We've moved from just the home into the enterprise. We now do, in the last four years, about $5 billion of contract value of printing, doing a company's printing. One of the places we don't have the printing business is at the University of California Haas School of Business, <laughs> which I, I, I've noticed That's today. That's the time we have. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have, to, we'll have to get to the top guy and see what we can do. So, but at the same time, we've moved into that market. You're going to see us into the example. Uh, have you, anybody here uh, use Snapfish? Anybody here use Snapfish? So Snapfish is an HP company. And Snapfish is, it's not because we wanted a cool website, although we did. Um, Snapfish is your photos in the cloud. And, and trust me, with HP's uh, printing capabilities, all those photos are printed on HP. Walmart has a HP retail photo kiosk in the Walmart. If you went to walmart.com and did photos on walmart.com, that's actually Snapfish. But it's branded as Walmart. The retail photo kiosk is in the store, and then at Walmart you can buy a home printer. Think of that as a three-way ecosystem of HP infrastructure to capture that printed page in the cloud, at the retail store, or at the home. We're doing the same thing going to a company saying we can take 25% out of your printing costs by helping realign the placement of the printers and doing all the services, including the supplies of those printers. So numerous things, but think of us going after the pages, not necessarily the printers. So, for example, uh, today, we just introduced two or three weeks ago a wireless printer. This is the first time in the home. It used to be you had to go through the PC to get to the web. Now you can go straight from the printer to the web. Huge change because now on the printer, you can go print a map directly on the printer and not have to go through the PC. Well, now I've got to have a screen on the printer that allows you to visualize just as easily as you could through the PC. Big cultural change in terms of secular trends about how we're going to do things. Wireless printers, believe it or not, print 20% more pages than a non-wireless printer because of just the ease of use. So lots of changes going on in printing. I give you an example of, 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 of Bank of America. We do all of Bank of America's printing. They told us this year they'd print 900 million pages. They printed 1.1 billion. So people are printing more than they ever have. We need strategically to move to where the pages are. That's why we're in retail photo kiosks. That's why we're in the, on the cloud or in the cloud. It's why we're in big companies managing their printing. And it's why we've built a thing called a graphics business, which actually sells printing to small printers that print collateral material, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where the real growth is. Try to give you the shortest answer I could, printing long subject. Great business, though. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I would tell you one thing that might be interesting for you. Our biggest problem in printing, counterfeiting. So, you know, it's funny that somebody says, hey, did you see, somebody always asks me, did you see there's a refiller now filling ink? You know the share that refillers have? Almost none, because the quality is so poor of the ink. The real problem we have is counterfeiters. And the reason counterfeiters are such a problem is there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of fake HP ink in the market. And we're doing everything we can to cut it out. And it's a huge problem for us because the quality's low and the consumer thinks they're buying from us. Most of it emanates out of, out of emerging markets, I'll leave it at that, where IP is, <laughs> is not protected. And so it's a huge deal for us to get that right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Uh, what efforts are you doing to maintain the corporate culture? Because I know Hewlett Packard has really been renowned historically for really promoting like the employees and motivated employees equals fantastic work. So I know that there's been a lot of consolidation. There's a lot of areas that you're looking into growth. How are you maintaining the structure? Yeah, so in some degree, you know, culture adapts with the company, right? So I mean, for example, we're, we're driving very much a performance-oriented culture. I gave Rich a, a thought earlier that, that as you're a manager, when you think about culture, and we're really trying to drive innovation, trying to create demand, and trying to, try, trying to create uh, great service experiences beyond it. But let me give you this tip about culture. Whatever your culture you want it to be in whatever company you are, think about every time you recognize somebody. Think about every time you reward somebody. Think about every time you promote them. And to be very blunt, although people sometimes don't like this, every time you demote, or even if you fire somebody, Anytime you did any of those five things in our company, let's say I did that to somebody, any one of those five things, 
all 300,000 people in our company get the same message, what I value. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you have created culture every time you've taken an action. Every time you recognize somebody, I would tell you as a leader, you should explain to everybody why you did it. Every time you reward somebody, the more public and clear you can be as to why you did it, I would do it. Every time you promote somebody, everybody will want to emulate that performance, and you will create culture. So for example, if you say, I have just promoted you because you made a presentation, and I thought the charts were, they looked great. <laughs> what do you think will happen? If I say, I promoted you because I'm going to make you the head of the engineering group because you just developed the first wireless printer. What do you think people that are engineers in the company will say? Ah, I need to come up with a wireless printer-like solution. I'm going to go do that. You've got to be clear. And that will, in the end, evolve culture. Packard, particularly, who really was the, the operating guy in the company, made a point of having a thing called management by objectives. His view was to connect everybody in the company through a series of MBOs. Now, in all fairness, when Dave was running the company, last time he was there was 16,000 people. Now we've got 300,000. Yeah. So this isn't a winogram on my part, but it's just a bigger outfit. But the concept's still the same. The more I can connect through those eight layers, me to you, and by the way, we struggle with that. We're not by no means perfect with it. By any means. Don't take anything I say as we're perfect at it. But the more I can have a conversation where you and I can connect, I can tell you our strategy, you can say, I can fit, I understand how I fit into that strategy, the more power you get from the entity and the more exponent of productivity you gain. Culture gets created by actions. So and those again, actions have to be supported. Once again, it goes to clarity. So you make sure that you're very clear in recognizing outstanding achievement and rewarding. I that. try. Yeah. For example, I'll give you an example. Uh, last week, we had a um, very unfortunate situation occur. We had the Wall Street Journal print an article that was ridiculous. <laughs> ridiculous. But it was clear somebody in the company had thought they had information they passed improperly across to the Wall Street Journal. Okay? Let me make sure you're clear. I don't like that. Just to be clear, I call my team together to say, just so I'm not accusing it, this is unacceptable. And if, and if I found out who did that, <laughs> Because I want them to know what I value. I want them to know what I value at every turn. And the more they're clear on that, and the more in turn they're clear, the better the company performs, in my opinion. So well, I'll try to be as kindly. clear as I can be. Thank you. In the 1.9 trillion uh, IT market that you put up there before, I'm curious what markets are in the 500 million that you're not going after, and how did you go about deciding we're not going after that right now. Sure, and sometimes you know it's not always conscious. Most of the market, there are some areas in services that we don't go after. There are some markets in networking we don't have products in, sort of in the high end, home networking. So there's, it's more um, slices of a segment as opposed to big segments. You're not gonna find any $500 billion totals. You're gonna find a $30 billion piece of this 60 billion dollar market, that, that type. Like the mainframe market, inside the server market, we don't make mainframes, we replace them. So therefore, the mainframe segment of the market that's shrinking is not in our addressable market. So there are no big, big segments like that. There's slices of segments that we're in. And then we're actually trying to flip the share, if you can imagine, in the segments we're in as opposed to the ones that we're not. Thanks. I, uh, what are the issues that keep you up at night? Uh, so, about, uh, uh, about the business? <laughs> I, I was curious about the business, but you can talk about anything you want. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, I, I, I'll try to keep it focused on the business for the sake of the discussion, but I appreciate the question. The, um, you know, listen, I think um, when you come from where I came from um, and growing up in the IT industry, I would tell you it's just one thing. Um, 
the greatest honor I could have in my business career is to be the CEO of Hewlett Packard. It's the greatest honor I could have. That said, I think the opportunity for this great company is fantastic. It's just huge. It's already achieved a lot of milestones sort of to, to Rich's point. I think it has a chance to be one of the uniquely great companies on the planet. And what would keep me up at night would not be a conduit and a catalyst to making that happen. And if that were to be the case, that would be a big disappointment. So I think the opportunity for the company is huge. There are lots of tactical issues, but at the end of the day, my job, singularly, focused on those three things, is to get the company to the absolute best place it can be. And everything we do at HP, it's no good to be better than the benchmark. It's no good to be better than median. We have to be the best. The best. All right. Listen, I, it didn't look like there were more questions. I, I just thank you. I hope uh, nothing you take today, one thing for sure, that uh, what I described to you is that we're the best yet at everything we do. It's what we aspire uh, to be, and uh, we'll uh, keep pushing at it. So I wish you all just the best of luck in your careers and your schooling. Sounds like you've got a great school here and a, a great team. So good luck. Thank Thanks. you, Mark. A quick comment as we as we break here. Uh, this was on point. The quality of people we get through here and the connectivity of this school with firms like HP. It's a really important relationship for us, and I know you know that. One last point: uh, If you're a first year MBA, you heard it. Orientation. We started with a leadership model, right? Every business school says our mission is to develop leaders. We started in orientation with this model, and we said leadership. Let's break it down into these three categories: strategic leadership operational leadership, and people leadership. I mean, the, the consonance with what he just said was wonderful. We appreciate your message. Thank you very much. <laughs>